welcome to you all. I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, uh, co-sponsor of tonight's event with the Institute of Politics. You, I assume, are political junkies, or you would not be here, and you have a real treat in store. The three people that you're going to hear from tonight have a lot of things to commend them. I'm only going to speak about one thing in particular that they have in common. They all have a direct connection with the Shorenstein Center. John Heilman, who was a student at the Kennedy School, was one of the first students to hang out at the, Kennedy, at the Shorenstein Center. Mark Halpern was a co-fellow at the Institute of Politics and the Shorenstein Center. And Joe Klein is a fellow at the Shorenstein Center now. Um, Joe Klein is the uh, moderator for tonight, the interviewer, and the interviewees are the authors of these two books that I know you know about. What you should understand is that all three of the people who you'll be hearing from tonight are best-selling authors about politics, especially about campaigns. And uh, I don't know which one has sold more books, but I do remember vividly that when Anonymous, Joe's novel, about the, the Clinton administration and the 1992 campaign was published. The speculation about who Anonymous was was uh, something that this country has not seen in quite a while. He told a story, and so did John and Mark. Um, I'm very pleased to have them here. Joe Klein, who is going to introduce the other two, is a uh, an editor at large and the lead uh, political columnist for Time Magazine. Uh, with that, Joe, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alex. Um, you know, I should start off by admitting something, which is um, that we're, we've been friends for a long time. We're so close that we've slept together on a lot of buses and airplanes <laughs> and vans in Iowa, in New Hampshire, um, and... Uh, these are two people I respect a lot. Uh, I've read, I read the first book I'm about 40% of the way through this book, and I, I can't wait to see how it turns out. <laughs> um, but it's, al it's apparent to me already that the reporting job, you know, the writing in both is, is great storytelling. The reporting job in this one, which I thought should have been much harder than the re reporting job in an open seat presidency, the last one. The reporting job in this one is just truly extraordinary. Uh, you seem to have gotten to everyone. Um, I'm not going to ask you whether you got to everyone, but I am going to ask you, how do you go about doing that? How do you get to people that nobody else can get to? Uh, well, uh, first of all, we're uh, psyched to be here. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Um, it is, uh, we both have uh, attachments to this place and, and we're always happy to come back to Harvard. This is um, a, a great venue to be uh, in, to have a chance to talk about the book. We're also great, really happy to be paired with Joe, who um, is not only someone who's been a good friend of ours for a long time, but someone I know Mark and I both look up, have both looked up to for a long time as an exemplar of how to do this, this work. And that I think, would imply that I'm older than you. Well, I am. <laughs> just, by a just by a little bit, just by a little bit. Um, More than that. You know, I think you know the answer to some extent, Joe. I mean, one of the ways that we go about doing this is we have the, the, what, maybe the greatest luxury that you can have in this world now, which is, and, and it's, it's easy to overstate this, but we have time. And we don't have that much time, and people start to get um, antsy for the book even when it's only a year after Election Day. Um, you know, there, people are wanting to know when the book's going to come out, when the book's going to come out. But we're, we feel like we're under pressure to get the book out within a year or a little bit more than a year in the case of the first book after the election's over. But that gives us a lot of the thing that most reporters in their day-to-day -day jobs don't have any of now. And one of the things we've all seen in the course of our, of our time doing this over the past two, three decades um, is, you know, the, the news cycle has gotten faster and faster and the metabolism of our business is faster and faster. We've gone from, you know, real news cycles to the 24-7 news cycle to now the minute-by-minute, instant-by-instant news cycle. People just don't have the time to do what we do, which is in this book, in the case of this book, 500 interviews with more than 400 people where we have long interviews with people, not on the phone, almost always face-to-face, -face, almost always with both of us there, 
and we're able to go and sit with people who we've known for a long time in almost every instance, from candidates all the way through the senior to junior to uh, lowest of junior level of staffers, and sit with people for two hours or three hours or four hours and say, tell us your stories in the first instance, and then come back to them and with more precision about the scenes that we want, have decided that we want to draw. And that, that, that quantity of interviews and the t quantity of time, I think, leads to the qualitative difference, to the extent there is a qualitative difference, is where, where we, we were able to bring something, we're able to get to places. Some of it has to do with the fact that we do it after the election or much of it after the election when people's memories are fresh and they also feel free to talk. But a lot of it has to do with that ability to circle back with people over and over again and report and then re-report and then report and then re-report, which really no one in the internet broadcaster or print has the time to do in the course of a presidential campaign under normal circumstances. I'll just add a couple things. One is uh, to say also thank you all for coming and, and to the Institute Insurance Team for hosting us and, um, and Joe, you for, for doing this. Um, as John said, we both um, are in, have been inspired by your work, not forever, but for a long time, because <laughs> forever would suggest you're much older. Um, you know, John mentioned the fact that people are always pressuring us to get the book out faster and they say a year is too long to wait for a campaign book. I like to remind people that, with all due respect to our other colleague, you know, it took Doris Kearns Goodwin like 100 years to get her <laughs> Roosevelt book out. So by that standard, we're pretty fast. Um, but it does involve asking a lot of people, particularly um, for different reasons, the, the, two, the two general election campaigns. People in the, in the winning campaign, a lot of them are either in the White House or off trying to start new things. And the people in the Romney campaign, obviously came off a very dis a bit large professional disappointment. So we ask people patiently, and I think one of the things that, that, that um, allows us to do it is we have good relationships with people in both parties. And, and in the world in which we live today, that's increasingly rare in journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but but to, to go inside a White House of a Democrat, as well as numerous campaigns of Republicans, a lot of Republicans who ran on uh, anti-media platforms, is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But I think that one of the things John said matters most of all, which is it, in almost every case we're dealing with people who've known us for a long time and, and understand what we're doing. And we're willing to be patient with them and, and accommodate their schedules as, as, uh, as much as, uh, as time allows. Um, so, th and this is something that I, that I wasn't fully aware of. The lion's share of the reporting happens after the election. Yeah, I'm not sure what the exact percentage is, but we try to, you know, there's a balance between giving people a sort of a decent interval and also just the real, being realistic about when you can get on somebody's schedule with memories fading away. So we mm -hmm. try to report the early stuff early mm -hmm. uh, and during whatever lulls exist. And then particularly with the, either the losing campaigns or the, uh, we write a fair amount in this book about people who didn't run. We try mm -hmm. to get to them, get that stuff sort of out of the way as early right. as possible. But in terms of the general election, um, we do some interviews during, but the, but the vast majority is after. Mm -hmm. And you have these natural moments, right, where, as Mark said, with the people who didn't, who decided not to run on the Republican side, we, you know, we, we, the, the total arc of it was three years in this, the case of this book, from the summer of 2010 to the summer of 2013. But, you know, there were natural breakpoints when that group in the spring of 2011 basically decided not to run, Haley Barber and Jeb Bush and the others who decided not to get in the race, Mitch Daniels, that was a natural time after that to talk to people in the summer of 2011. Mm -hmm. In the summer of 2012, we talked to a lot of the Republican, the people, the Republican candidates and the Republican people who were on those candidates who had lost in the Republican nomination fight because they were now you know, relatively free in that summer of 2012 and we had a little bit of time. But a lot of that general election stuff, and the White House reporting was kind of ongoing. We did a lot of that just you know, contemporaneously throughout. That, that, that was spread more evenly. But then really the biggest sprint, I mean really from election day through May or June of 2013, we did, you know, I mean, I, I would not think the exact percentage, but I would say the majority, if you added the total, the total number of interviews, I'd say more than half were done in that seven month period. Um, Mark raised a very interesting point, which is that you have sources in both parties. Both of you are working journalists, though, and you've been known to have pretty sharp elbows. Mark, I turn to your ratings of the debates you know, which are almost instantaneous. I mean, if you keep on giving Rick Perry an F, <laughs> or, or pretty damn close to it, uh, that must make it harder for you to do it. And also on a more substantive level, John, you take positions on a lot of issues in New York Magazine. Um, how do you go about 
smoothing it over? And, and, and do you have any really great interviewing s strategies that some of the young uh, potential journalists in the audience would, uh, would appreciate knowing about? I'll take the second and easier question. Um, uh, be really prepared for interviews. You know, when you're asking extremely busy people to take two, three hours out of their day, um, it's good to be prepared. And we found often people praised us for our preparation. And have a sense of what matters in the interviews and listen to the answers. Part of, part of the benefit of two authors is one of us can listen more closely while the other one's leading the questioning and that come, is a benefit. come back in and, and, and uh, I mean, it happens all the time in our interviews where I'll be going along thinking I'm covering everything and then John will, if I'm first chairing that interview, will come in and, and ask a lot of questions that were obvious in retrospect, but it's just harder, as you know, when you're doing an interview, even if it's not a live interview on television, it's just hard to keep everything straight, to listen, figure out the next question and all of right. that. Right, right. Well, the other thing in terms of in terms of interviewing techniques, I don't think I think you've left out the most important one, which is that in asking for interview time with uh, any of our sources, we always have the subject line in the email be, uh, "Do you like pina coladas?" That's always the, <laughs> that's always the first thing because the promise of the promise of a lot of alcohol often helps in terms of securing the interviews, and then and then the delivery of a lot of alcohol helps with the actual conducting. You also have to be able to drink better than they do. Yes, well, that's uh, that's one thing that we've mastered at this point. Um, much We're to journalists. Our, much much, to, the, much to the detriment of our livers. Um, you know, the other question I think, well, one of the things I, that I've found, and uh, Joe, I bet you, you found this too, is that so much of what matters in terms of how people feel about the positions you, the criticisms, whether it's Mark's debate grades or uh, columns that I've written that have been critical of either Republicans or Democrats, is that, is that we, we do them from a place where we, that first of all, they know that we're, that are the we're, that we're reporters first, right? So mm -hmm. they know that that the judgments we're making are we're making analytical judgments, not partisan judgments. So when Mark says that that Rick Perry had an F on the debate stage, it's not because he hates Republicans. It's because he thought Rick Perry didn't perform well in the debate. And in truth, most of the people around Rick Perry knew that that debate performance right. was an F, and so they might be mad in the moment. But three months later, it's like, well, you know, yeah, that was kind of right. And from my perspective, you know, when when you do when we've done. Uh, do, political policy critiques of Republicans, I, they're not laced with the kind of partisan rancor that a lot of people now from the left attack Republicans. You know? So you know, we, we kind of will we'll be very critical, but it's in a weird way respectful. And it's the totality of they see us on, in a lot of different forums, you know, on television, other places, talking about being, being critical but civil about their candidates, as opposed to mindlessly critical all the time and in a, part, a harsh partisan way. And they also know that you know, when Mitt Romney does something smart, they see me say, well, he did that, that was, he was great in that debate, or he did this, that was fantastic. Or you know, I write a piece about how Rick Santorum could beat Mitt Romney and evaluate Santorum's strengths coming out of Iowa. You know, and they recognize they take the good with the bad in those cases, as long as it doesn't feel to them like you have a vendetta against them. That would make our lives a lot harder if they think if they felt that we were, that we were carrying out, that we were in some way uh, reflexively opposed to them. But if they feel as though the criticism is coming from a place of fairness, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier for them to get over it in the, in the aftermath, it seems to me. I, I'd just say quickly, you mentioned Rick Santorum. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did not know until this campaign, which, which I found incredibly touching and inspirational, was your relationship with Rick, Sor Rick Santorum. You know, you've written tough things about him, you've critiqued his policy positions, but he's got extraordinary respect for you. And, um, and that is, again, increasingly rare but it's something that if you care about your reputation as a journalist and you want to be able to do your job, you have to have that kind of professional, personal respect that flows in a way that, that allows you to say what you think, write what you think, but also continue to do your job and, and continue to have access. Well, um, I, let me just add, my own favorite questions in an interview are, really? And also my second favorite is, no kidding, because these people have egos, and if they think you're just absolutely amazed by what they're telling you, they'll tell you more. Um, so my response to what you guys just said, really? No, uh, but. <laughs> the other, the other but, good one, as you know, Joe, is when, is when somebody gives you an answer or you ask a question and they give you an answer, when they finish the answer, you just sit there silently? Because mm -hmm. the, 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 right, the right. silence fills the room and they kind of feel like, well, they must, 
and now must say more. And then the next thing you know, they're saying many more things than they really intended to at the outset. The, the best, the best advice I got along those lines was not about how to do the interview, but how to get somebody on the phone to do an interview mm -hmm. from my former ABC News colleague, Bridge Hume, who said if you called up and asked for somebody, if the assistant said, what is this in reference to? You say, malfeasance. <laughs> <laughs> they always call back. Right. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to use that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but the points you make, and, and especially the point you made, John, um, is really interesting to me because I've been doing this for 45 years, and I've watched our na natural skepticism, which is the way journalists should be, slide into cynicism. You know, in some ways, the toughest story for a young reporter to write is a positive story about a politician. Um, I couldn't have gotten away with writing a story in the New Yorker about um, the, the Santorum's uh, decision uh, when, when Mrs. Santorum was, uh, uh, was suffering from sepsis and was pregnant. Uh, they were going to try and see that through um, at, the, at the risk of her life. I couldn't have written that story when I was 25 years old and gotten away with it. Um, do you, think, do you think that there's been a shift in, in the way that journalists look at politicians over the time that you've been doing it? Um, uh, I guess, when, we, when were your first campaigns? You, 92, right? 96, for real. Mm -hmm. yeah. But ha has the atmosphere changed on our part, and then also has the atmosphere changed on their part? Yes, and almost all for the worse. I mean, we have a lot less access than we used to. Well, um, not you guys, <laughs> well, not, and not ex post yeah. facto. I mean, you know, when our first campaign I covered was Bill Clinton, and we had tons of access to him. We woke up in the morning, saw him in the hotel lobby, <laughs> would see him throughout the day, talk to us on the bus, stop and talk to us at every rope line. Uh, towards the middle of the campaign, after uh, sort of the regulars were established on the campaign plane, we had so much time with him, it was not unusual for him to come the back of the plane to talk to us on the last flight of the night and for us to pretend to be asleep mm -hmm. because we'd had enough time with Bill Clinton, we wanted to do other things and wait for him to go back to the front. Um, that, that kind of access just doesn't happen. Now, it's true if you go out early now, if you went, if you went to Iowa with you know, Ted Cruz or, or Rand Paul today, you could get some access. But candidates are a lot more wary. Reporters, I think, are more cynical. One of the things we try to do in the book is to, is to write about everybody with empathy. Uh, the mm -hmm. candidates, their spouses, their families, as they put themselves forward uh, for this difficult thing. But I think in general, it, it, is, it is harder than it was at the beginning of my career to write positive stories. It's harder to uh, uh, give people the benefit of the doubt, and it's harder to, um, to have any nuance uh, in how you approach mm -hmm. a policy position or from either a candidate's point of view or a reporter's point of view. And again, I think the, the, the country is worse off because as they get more afraid of cameras and, and microphones and Twitter, uh, they're more, more withdrawn. I think Governor Romney, uh, personality, if, if everybody in the country were directly exposed to him, I think he would have done substantially better. But he had trouble uh, translating his personality in the formats and the forums that the press, uh, that he was in, in which he was willing to engage with the press and the public. Yeah, I'd say, although everything Mark just said is true, I, the, the, there's the, the the, the, the partisanship and the ideological uh, uh, polarization, which is so much a big feature of our politics, is obviously a huge thing in the press now. We've talked about that a little bit, right? But it really has become, to your point, Joe, is that, that there's a, it's not even, I wouldn't even say cynicism. It's just, it's this notion that f for people who are covering the race from one side or the other, covering a race or covering governance from one side or the other, mm -hmm. that whatever the opposite side is, that nothing that politicians from that party says is, it, it's not just wrong, it's that it's, it's, they're liars. Every, there is no presupposition of good faith. It's not that, well, this conservative has, have, could have legitimate reasons for opposing Obamacare, uh, or this liberal could have legitimate reasons for wanting to do X, Y, or Z. It's the president is evil, he's a liar, he's a socialist, he's a communist, he's a, perpetrating a fraud. Or Speaker of the House is a, is a fascist. And, and all of that becomes so corrosive, because it's not just you know, spirited partisan argument, right? It's, it's, it's the core assumption of bad faith on the part of the other side. And no one can take seriously what the other person is saying and try to empathize with and try to see where they're coming from, right? That's the first thing. But the second thing is also this other thing, which is much more benign in the sense that that's a much more, I think, a conventional critique. 
There's also this other thing, which is that I think that as we have seen what I think is a largely healthy thing, which is the incursion of rigor and analytics around data, right, which is a big story in our business now, right, the notion of being focused on quantitative metrics and all of the stuff that makes up the science of covering politics and covering campaigns and covering electoral dynamics, is that a lot of the younger people who, are, who think that stuff is really important, which I don't dispute that it's important, don't seem to love politicians and the art of politics and the humanity of politics in the way that I know all three of us do. That it's kind of like become sort of, well, it, they, they see it as this binary thing of it's either you focus on one or the other. Either you're focused on the human side and that's all soft and squishy, or you're focused on the numbers and the data and that's all hard and real. And I think for you know, any real view of how politics works is, you know, it's both. I both of those things are really important. And it seems sad to me that there is increasingly the lack of kind of joyful love of the game and these people, these outsized characters who are so fascinating and, and so ca captivating. It's the reason why we do what we do, which is to tell that story, that Shakespearean piece of it, which is what's the, what's the humanity here? What's the, what's the heart of this story and not just the, the ones and zeros on the page? Yeah, I think that Richard Ben Kramer's book, um, the name is extinct. What It Takes. What It Takes, about the 1988 campaign. Um, you know, it's really hard to write a, a fascinating book about a good campaign. This guy wrote a fascinating book about one of the worst campaigns I ever covered, one of the most boring campaigns, and he did it because he appreciated the fact that politicians are actually human beings. So I want to go back to Romney as a human being. Back in 2005, 2006, um, I came up here to interview him about his health care plan. Um, and I found him to be really smart, really forthcoming, um, willing to think in my presence, funny, and I came away thinking, um, this guy may have a future in politics. Uh, what happened? Why was that guy never seen? You referenced it before. Well, part of the answer lies in the book um, and in how he approached his second campaign for president. And, his fr and, and he kind of uh, locked himself in uh, from the first race. He, he sort of made two broad decisions that ended up um, being in contradiction. One was that he wasn't going to flip-flop about anything, that he'd been tagged as a flip-flopper in 2008 when he ran, and no matter what happened, he wasn't going to change any position. But he also wanted to not run, as he had in 2008, as the most conservative candidate in the race, the social conservative. He wanted to run more as a guy who could fix the economy. The problem was he'd taken all these positions in 2008, uh, social positions. And so if he says, I'm not going to flip-flop, that means he's, he was locked into all those same positions. And those were positions that not only, in some cases, did he seem personally uncomfortable with the substance of them, but he recognized that a lot of them would make winning a general election quite problematic. So I think those are two of the biggest things. But I think the sort of more, more right. less tactical decisions and more personally, he's, he's, he has trouble, as I said before, showing himself in the, modern, the conventional modern forums of presidential politics. He's, uh, uh, he's uh, uh, someone who does not like the phoniness and the staginess of politics, like the president, but isn't that good at faking it? Isn't that good? And that's good why he would recite forward? God bless America right. in his stump speech. Yeah. He just he, <laughs> he, he, he relied on he relied on things like that because he didn't he didn't feel he could be himself. Not he's just not that great at form. You know, David Axrod said famously, presidential campaigns are MRIs of the soul. And that mm -hmm. the reason the president was confident he'd win re-election was because in, in the end, people would see Governor Romney. I think the greatest frustration of a lot of people in the Romney political family and his real family was they don't feel the country ever did see him. They ever didn't ever see him the way he was. And I, as I said before, I'm confident they didn't see a lot of him. Now, whether if they'd seen more of him, everyone would have liked him a lot more, I don't know. But they would have liked him somewhat more than, than what he portrayed, mm -hmm. projected rather. I like to just think of there's a place, you haven't gotten it yet in the book, but there's a, um, a place in the book where Bill Clinton offers his private assessment of Mitt Romney as a politician. <laughs> he says, uh, I think he's a very nice man. He's in the wrong line of work. He should not be speaking to people in public. <laughs> and I, I just got to go with that. <laughs> um, but actually, he was better on health care one-on-one 
than Clinton was, <laughs> in my experience. Uh, what about on the Obama side? What's your evaluation of him <coughs> on the basis of having seen him do two campaigns? What did he learn from the first one? Um, and was, did he learn the right things or the wrong things? Well, I think he learned, you mean in terms of what, what, what did he learn from the first campaign that, and did he learn the right things or the wrong things in terms of governance or in terms of poverty? Both. Wow, well those are... The, the those are interactive, the, the, interact, the, I believe yes. that, that he, he did things in the campaign that have really damaged his ability to govern, especially the way he sold uh, health care in 2012. Yes. Uh, but also there's the question of whether he whether you can get away with running for president successfully twice, how you can get away with running for president successfully twice and not like people very much. Yes. Those are some very large questions. I'm going to try to take, I'm going to try to take one, one bite at one side of it, and I think Mark will talk about it in a, in a, in a different way. But there's... I may just stay and try to get a PhD thesis mm -hmm. out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that w one of the things that's, that's, that's... In psychology, probably, right? One of the things that's true over the arc of both books is that, is that I think President Obama problematically doesn't see the connection between campaigning and governing in the way that you do and that was implicit in your question. I think, you know, what he thought in 2012 was that there was a way for him to... He, he clearly saw that the stakes of the election were very high. He thought that, that he needed to... That, that if he lost, much of what he'd accomplished in the first term would be wiped away. He thought that, that the, the winning meant more to him than the, winning the first race did, even though the first race was seen as mm. this big historic thing. He thought the stakes for the country were very high, et cetera, et cetera. He also thought that the way that, that he, he said this over and over again, if he won, he might be able to break the fever. He kept saying you know, that well, the Republican opposition to him and the ferocity of it would be reduced if he won, because he would get a mandate for the next four years, he would get vindication for the last four years. He was sure right about that one. And, and, yet, and yet, and I think partly to your point, is he ran a campaign that was kind of at odds with that in spirit and tone, right? He ran mm -hmm. a campaign that was, you know, largely based on, and I think strategically it made perfect sense, but largely based on the disqualification of Mitt Romney, and not based on either or making the argument for what he had done, and certainly not on, mm -hmm. on, on putting forward a, a big, bold, forward-looking agenda for, for the next four years. And so having run a largely relentlessly effective negative campaign, he looked up on election day and thought that he had a mandate, but really had no mandate at all. And I think, you know, we could talk about health care if you want, but certainly mm -hmm. the fact that health care did not get litigated uh, by, you know, either by the president or by Governor Romney in the course of 2012 is a large part of the problem that we currently have, which is that conservatives don't feel as though the issue got litigated in 2012. They feel like Mitt Romney dropped the ball. So it's not settled law in their view. They think it's still contestable. And um, Obama has nothing like a, a, any real support for the thing as he encounters the choppy waters that were kind of inevitable. Not that these particular problems were inevitable, but that it was never going to be smooth. And yet, heading into rough seas on a huge thing like this, with still only, you know, going into it, only 45 or so percent of the country being in favor of it was a massive problem. And I think, you know, not having run in a more, in a more thoroughgoing way on it in the course of the campaign le has left him in a worse place than if he had. You have this? Well, just to say a version of what John said in a slightly different way, you know, the president's very good at campaign. And as we show in the book, uh, particularly around the debates, he doesn't like them. He doesn't like them. No, that's he's, he's very good at them. He doesn't like stuff. them. Government, he loves government. Loves public policy, loves wonky discussions, loves problem solving. But at least so far, you'd have to say he's not as good at government at politics, and some people would render a harsher judgment about his ability to run the federal government. So he's very good at what he doesn't like, and he's not very good at what he does like, and he's not resolved those tensions in the process of winning twice and thinking, except for assuming that the win would allow him to do things, thinking through how to change public opinion and the dynamics of Washington through electoral victory. Um, we're going to go to questions in a minute. Let me just ask you one last question. If you can, people who have questions, if you can line up at these microphones. Um, do you think that it's possible to have a national conversation uh, on a topic as complicated as health, health insurance reform? Um, and if not, 
because I kind of have become skeptical about that. Uh, how do where are we going in terms of the way campaigns are contested, and is it good for the country? Well, this is one where I'm not sure the good old days were that different than they are now. I, I'm, I, think, I think, as flawed as the conversation around the Affordable Care Act has been, there aren't too many debates that, I, that I've covered in my career that were significantly more robust in terms of the substance of it. This is more serious because of the size of the program and its impact on everybody's life. But I think that, I think that it's very hard to do, but the reason why it's particularly hard now goes back to what I think was the biggest mistake the president's made in office, which is doing health care in a partisan way. I think mm -hmm. it's pretty clear his chief of staff believed and others believed he could have passed a smaller bill that would have covered a lot of people but not have been able to be called universal with Republican votes. And that would have made a world of difference in its implementation and in the kind of the education process that officials would do. There are some Republicans who are helping their constituents implement this, mm -hmm. but they're not out there doing public education. They're not out there no. trying to make it a settled law, popular, uh, woven into the fabric of American life. And I think if you had something that was bipartisan, you could have more of a discussion than we're having now. We would have had a great, you know, it's a, the, I, the first time I've ever thought this, but uh, it, we would have had an awesome national conversation on national health care if Mitt Romney had won the presidency in 2008. Because, mm -hmm. because in 2008, when, when, when Mitt Romney was being endorsed by Jim DeMint, mm -hmm. and Massachusetts healthcare was not toxic, because the individual mandate at that point was not yet toxic in the Republican Party, even in 2008, not totally toxic, because it hadn't yet been embraced by Barack Obama, you know, a Republican governor who had taken this model from Massachusetts and talked about doing it in some way on the national level, you could have had a really great conversation about national health care in that context, but but in, 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 under the current circumstances, right, I'm not sure we could ever have a, a conversation about it. It would have to be a Republican proposing, the, in some setting where the, the Republican was proposing the most liberal policy that a Republican could get away with proposing, you could then have a real discussion. But in the current context, I, I think we've blown it. The irony, of course, is that I've been, I've been in favor of um, the individual mandate ever since it came out of the Heritage Foundation. You know, the Obama health care plan is a Republican plan. With, I, with loud I, backing by Newt Gingrich. Uh, and, and I supported it against the uh, employer mandate that Hillary proposed in 1994, uh, which led to some interesting discussions between the First Lady and me. Uh, so now we're going to questions. Uh, most important thing here is no diatribes. I know that a lot of people make statements that sound like questions. Um, but these should be real questions, and they should be, um, and they should be concise. What Joe's trying to say is leave the diatribes up to us. We do yes. that professionally. Um, but so, I. I'm, oh, and you have to identify yourself. That's the other uh, Kennedy School rule. Hi, Colin Mark, freshman in Harvard College. I, I was interested in your observation that Obama ran what was largely a negative campaign against Mitt Romney because. A few weeks ago, we had one of the leaders in, Ob in Obama's advertising team presenting the very positive ads that were released by the Obama campaign and explaining that Obama was trying to communicate that message that you felt he didn't get across. And I wanted to know why you feel the people or uh, the reporters didn't see that as the message of the Obama campaign in 2012. Did you ask the person how many times the ads they showed you ran as compared to the negative ads? Right, we, the, I was at that, and there were also the you know the Republicans involved, you know, also showed the Obama negative ads, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that this audience, maybe not you in particular, but this audience uh, voted that the uh, Obama negative ads were unfair. Many of them, yeah. they, you know, they ran some positive ads, and the president talked about positive things in his stump speech, but the number of negative ads dwarfed the number of positive ads. Number one, number two, uh, the the uh, rhetoric uh, that um, was used uh, by surrogates and by the president himself and the vice president, uh, as we report in the book, it really the president himself felt he didn't have much of an agenda to talk about in the eve of the second debate. What they decided early on they had to do was define, define Governor Romney, the super PAC that advertised on the president's behalf, advertised negatively against Governor Romney, and the president did not call on them to stop that. So 
I think there's some, there's some quantitative ways, like the number of ads that you could say overwhelmingly negative message, and then you can look at the strategy as described in our book and also in other places in real time about what they thought they had to do to win, which was like George Bush's strategy in 2004, make uh, the guy from Massachusetts seem out of touch. I'm Gavin Sullivan. I'm a, also a freshman at the college. And I'd like to know what you think the candidates of 2016 um, should take away from your book, especially with regards to some of that sensitive information that we've seen come out in the past few weeks and few months. Well, I think that the, the um, yeah, one, one of the things that one of the things that I, or two things I think are true from, from both from looking at both books, one of which is that you know there's one of the core lessons of the two books is that there's and this may seem obvious to you, but there's a there's a big gap between a politician's public uh, image and their private reality. In some cases, that gap is enormous. In the case of John Edwards, for instance, where it's a huge gap, right? In other cases, the gap is much narrower. And I think that one of the things you see in in presidential politics generally, and, and certainly in the course of these two books, is that candidates that have a smaller gap between their public image and their private reality tend to actually perform better. They tend to be more successful. And so I think candidates, and that's another way of talking about authenticity, I guess, or something that vaguely approximates authenticity. For candidates to be able to present themselves, to, to not to be running as something close to who they are, um, makes them better candidates. Not, I don't mean in some idealistic sense, I mean just literally as a, as a matter of effectiveness, they tend to be better. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, in this world that we live in now, and there's one particular story in, this, in the new book, in Double Down, that I think makes this clearer than anything else, which is the story of Rick Perry, that, you know, if you're going to run for president now, that you cannot decide to do it at the last possible minute. You can't decide to do it on a whim. You can't decide to do it um, late and in an unorganized way. You, you, you must approach it with great rigor and with great care. Um, because as we, uh, well, I mean, it's a story that has not gotten that much attention in the book, but the truth is, you know, Governor Perry, who might have been a very strong candidate, um, had he not decided to run in the summer of 2011 at the very last minute and then scheduled back surgery right before he decided to go run for president, which caused him all manner of, of problems in terms of his ability to perform, his stamina, his inability to sleep, a wide variety of problems. These are incredibly demanding exercises, the most physically, intellectually, psychologically, emotionally demanding thing you could ever do to yourself. You have to be ready for that. And if I were a, a candidate on either side in 2016, I would not ever want to underestimate that. I'd, if anything, I'd try to overestimate it, although I think it's probably impossible to overestimate it. Let's go upstairs. Good evening. My name is Auden Lawrence, um, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Um, so kind of jumping off of the last question, actually, that was just asked, um, you all devote an entire chapter in Double Down to Chris Christie. Um, and I'd like to know your thoughts on his potential in 2016, given some of the information that you all discuss in the book. I think right now he's as strong as anyone else in the Republican Party to be a potential nominee. I think the, 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 I put him in a tier with Jeb Bush and Paul Ryan, uh, above, above all the other people who get talked about. Um, and, and part of Governor Christie's strength is his, uh, his re-election in, in New Jersey, a Democratic state, shows it's got pretty broad appeal uh, to groups that Republicans have had trouble appealing to. And he's got a lot of uh, watchability and charisma. And that's just a reality of our presidential politics. Our last three presidents, uh, you could put them on Monday Night Football at halftime or Meet the Press or The Tonight Show, and they'd all do just fine. And Governor Christie could do all those things as well. So I think his, his candidate skills are good. His, his appeal is good. He, he believes in things in, in terms of reform which from outside Washington, which I think will be the message of the Republican nominee in 2016, no matter who it is, even if it's a, a sitting United States senator, I think that will be their agenda and, I think, and their message, and I think Governor Christie has that, um, has that has, that's an authentic claim to that. I think his, his weaknesses are, have to do with temperament. Uh, some of the things we write about in the book that Governor Romney and his team were concerned about as they considered him to be Governor Romney's running mate um, are things that will come up if he runs. But uh, John and I both think uh, this, the substance of those allegations and the questions, the unanswered questions about them are maybe not as important as how Governor Christie handles them. 
because he's got a record well documented on YouTube of speaking out um, and, and in a kind of emotion, emotional or passionate way. Uh, one of the YouTube clips that Governor Romney was given uh, of Governor Christie when he was considering him for his running mate was Governor Christie having a confrontation with a constituent on a, a Jersey Shore boardwalk uh, and the constituent walking away and Governor Christie pursuing him uh, to continue the conversation, brandishing an ice cream cone at his constituent. Like a weapon, some, like some, a weapon. Some voters might not find that the most presidential act they've ever seen. Um, <laughs> but, but there's no doubt that he's a bigger than life figure who's, um, whose command of politics is pretty strong. The last three presidents also could be campaign managers for presidential candidates, not themselves. Mm -hmm. And Governor Christie could do that too. And I think given the, the amount of pressure and, 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 uh, and weight that's put on the shoulders of a presidential candidate, someone who could run their own presidential campaign, they shouldn't run their own, but someone with the instincts to be able to run someone else's, it's a pretty valuable commodity. Could I just jump in here and ask you whether you think there's gonna be any kind of contest on the Democratic side in 2016? I think if, if, if Hillary Clinton decides to run, and I think we probably all think that she's m much more likely than not to run, although I don't think it's a guaranteed thing. If she decides to run, I, can't, I really you know, think that she will get the nomination pretty much by acclamation. And not simply on the basis of her, of her superstar status and her, 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 her stature in the party, but you know, because those are all obvious and they're given. She's a huge figure. But you, know, you think about you know, who makes up the Democratic nominating electorate. You know, women, huge constituency, profoundly believe that it's time for a, a major party female nominee in the, in the Democratic Party. That woman is Hillary Clinton at this moment. She has a very strong relationship with, with the African American community, very strong relationship with Latinos, very strong relationship with union households. I don't see where you would get a foothold in the Democratic Party running against her. Um, there are some talented Democratic alternatives, but I think most of them are smart enough um, to heed the adage that it makes only damn fools stand in the way of oncoming trains. And, and she is an oncoming train in this case. If you add up all of that, what also makes her more train-like is the fact she also, on top of all those things, is, you know, has head and shoulders above any, of, any other Democrat we know in terms of her ability to raise money. If you put all that together, I just can't imagine who could stop her. And the, and the closest, the, the only other pl player of her statue, stature is arguably, and only arguably, but arguably Joe Biden, who I think, and Mark and I would both agree, that will not run if she runs. Yeah, he'll be 74. He's had two brain aneurysms. Do you have a different opinion on this? No, um, John. No, I, I, you know, and, and they're very close. You know, they they, they're, they, you know, people can say, well, people are close, but when it comes to politics, put friendship aside. But they're they're. I no, think I mean on the question of whether there's going to be any kind of tussle. Well, no, I don't think he'll run. I don't think anybody else will run if she runs. Well, uh, of any of its significance. I mean, I think there'll be there'll be somebody from the far left who I think would run against her as a populist but I think she would just dominate in the way no non-incumbent has in our careers. Yeah, I, you know, my one caveat is that politics abhors a vacuum, and mm -hmm. there are always people who want to get known for the next one. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing. She should have a message if she runs beyond, mm -hmm. I'm the, can raise the most money and I have the most support in the polls. And I think that she also- Beyond being the inevitable candidate. That worked out, didn't work out that well in 2008. I think that she also has to figure out a way to distance herself from her husband's policies, especially his financial policies. Andrew Snyder, I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. This question's for both of you individually. What was your favorite vignette or a little bit of qualitative research that got left out of either book? Thank you for asking. It's available in the director's DVD cut. <laughs> um, we never talk about stuff we leave out of the book because we leave it out for a reason. So thank you for asking, but it just, it wouldn't be right, it's usually left, left out either because we couldn't confirm it or for some other reason. So there's nothing of note that we could mention. I'll say one thing that, that, that is in the book that has not gotten, the, there are many little things in the book that have not gotten that much attention that at the time we found delightful and wish more people paid attention to. I can think about 20, but the one that I'll mention here uh, because it's so brief is the fact that um, on election night when Governor Romney called uh, President Obama to concede, they had this conversation, the traditional concession phone call. And when they got off the call, um, Barack Obama did two things. The first was he said, call Bill, get Bill Clinton on the phone. That was his first phone call that he made on election night. But the second thing he said was he went to his advisor and said he was struck by the fact that Governor Romney made a real point on the call of being shocked by the turnout 
and Governor Romney expressed this to, to Barack Obama, he said, I'm just shocked by how, how well you guys turned out all those voters in Milwaukee and Cleveland. And President Obama's, and all of his aides, their attitude was when he said this, again, this kind of, like Obama says, this kind of mirthful smile on his face, and all the people around him, Jim Messina and Axelrod and Plouffe, they were all like, basically what Romney was saying was, God, where did all these mysterious minorities come from? Right. You know, <laughs> I, because it was Cleveland and, Ohio, and Cleveland and Milwaukee were his real focus, and it just sounded to them like, code for God, mm, God, maybe God, it's more than 47 percent yeah right exactly <laughs> yes hi hi my name is sylvia i'm a junior at the college um the washington post reported last month that north korea endorsed double down as proof that the u.s is the root cause of all sorts of evil it's funny i have that on my phone right here <laughs> i was actually going to yeah. be i was actually it's our best so, endorsement so far yeah <laughs> So I was wondering if you could comment on that and also talk a little bit about what journalists should do, especially in this social media age of individuals using their work to say or endorse things that they're not really advocating. It's rare that authors achieve exactly what they set out to do when they wrote a, write a book, but we were going for the North Korea endorsement. And Obviously. <laughs> because as you know, there's only one book club in the world more powerful than the Oprah book club, and that's the Kim Jong-un book club. Right? <laughs> Best endorsement you can get. Uh, you just, we just have to ignore stuff Stuff that you know people want to use the book for different arguments or make different points. We found that one a little bit humorous, but uh, the fact is, uh, other people have cited the book in other ways, both on the left and the right, um, dictatorships and democracies. And we just have to let the, the book speak for itself uh, and um, and uh, and try to stay out of stuff like that. Yes. Yes, David Leslie. Um, my question is, you're all journalists. And thinking back to when uh, Theodore uh, White wrote Making of the President, and I, reading those back in the day, thinking of much more as a historian, how do you folks see yourselves in putting this book together, the research, the writing, all of it? And what were your challenges and uh, opportunities and everything else as compared to what he had to do in his day when he was, I think, maybe the first that really did a comprehensive uh, book on the making of a president and how you see that is are there similarities did you realize did you look at how he yeah, went about things sure. etc well we're huge Thanks. we're huge students of 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 all of our predecessors and so you know uh, teddy white was the first person who did kind of kind of the first incarnation of modern campaign uh, narratives right but you know whether it was him or joe mentioned uh richard ben kramer's book what it takes you know hunter thompson's book on the 72 campaign they were all really different stylistically, um, but they all are kind of trying to do the same thing, which is um, both first to kind of pull back the curtain and show people what's really going on. There are these big, huge public events that um, are stage managed and orchestrated to uh, within a fairly well, and, 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 and we try to like sort of show people what's really going on, especially with the candidates themselves. What, and this, Teddy White did this. Thompson was doing it from a different vantage point. Richard Van Kramer very explicitly trying to get behind the eyes of the people who are running, the people closest to them, and what it feels like to experience a campaign from their point of view and not try to like collapse that distance. But I think all, in all of those instances, and in our book too, you know, there's journalism, and we're proud journalists, all of us, and Joe's done campaign books, and you know, we all feel, I think, I think we all feel the same way, which is that we're journalists, and then there are historians, and there are people who are gonna write books about these campaigns and these presidencies you know, for you know, next 100, 200, 300 years. But we're somewhere in that ground. We're doing something that's deeper than, than, than most of the journalism that gets done contemporaneously, largely because of the things we've talked about up here, about the time we can give to it. And, and it's, you know, first draft of history is a, sort of a cliche, but we're, we are getting things, I think, in, in these books because of the fact that people's memories are so bad. And we talk to them relatively closely after these contests and sometimes during the contest. We're getting things into the book that are that if we didn't talk, if we didn't do this, they would be lost to history, because much of these, much of the stuff would fade from memory very quickly. And there's not that much contemporaneous note taking. There's some, not that many recordings. There's some, but we're getting stuff kind of on the clay on the wheel that I think a lot of historians will look at, <coughs> use as source material. You know, when they write about these things years from now. So we're doing something like one step, one step closer to history than just pure journalism. But one step back from you know doing what historians will do w with the full uh, perspective of time and 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 all of the the, the things that, that that historical perspective and that vantage uh, endowed those authors with uh, years to come. Here's a basic rule about journalism and journalists: um, we are at our best 
when we're looking backward with rigor. How did something happen? Um, we're okay on what's happening now, but we really suck when, we, we, when we're asked to predict what's gonna happen next. And, and I think the strength of what you guys do is that you're looking back with rigor. Hi, I'm Will, I'm a sophomore in, uh, in the college, and my question is that a lot of the postmortem and the campaign has been that there's been, there was a big gulf in the effectiveness and competency of the actual campaigns themselves between the Obama and Romney campaign. And I was wondering if you guys got the sense from um, Republicans and others in your interviews that there was actually a campaign, like a structural um, gap between the campaigns, and if you guys could speak a little bit to that. I mean, you know, the president's team had the advantage of having run before with a lot of the same people, uh, with very no doubt, really, in anybody's mind, the president was going to run for re-election from the beginning, and for basically almost four years to modernize and update what they had done in the 2008 when they revolutionized uh, the way campaigns use technology to do all sorts of things, raise money and turn out voters and get messages to voters. I think that the you know, the phrase we use in the book is that the Obama people were building an atomic clock and the Romney people were using tinker toys. Um, you know, Governor Romney's team in the spring and summer of 2012 uh, complained a fair amount that they had a lot of ground to make up in a very short period of time. You know, that, that should have been apparent to anyone who ran for the Republican nomination that whether you won after a few contests or the, or the fight went all the way to the convention, you were going to have to make up a lot of ground in the technology area as it affects all those things, particularly grassroots organizing and fundraising. And Governor Romney never did that. Could someone else have done better? Probably not of the people who ran. But that was an, it was an incredibly imposing task to try to make up that ground. Probably, if you could turn back the clock, you would see the Republican National Committee or maybe a super PAC try to, try to fill in some of that, those areas to create something of a turnkey operation. But it didn't happen. And I think it's always, it is always the case that the winning campaign is painted as geniuses who figured everything out, and the losing campaign is painted as people who didn't know any, uh, what they were doing. In this case, th the technology gap was pretty clear. And I think um, while it would have been difficult to do better, it was incumbent upon somebody somewhere in Governor Romney's world, I think, to say, you know, if we don't get this piece further along off to the side, while we're struggling to win the nomination, winning the nomination won't be worth anything, and they really didn't do that. Yes. Adam Jones, I'm a second year at the business school. What role do you think the media plays in making a candidate? Your books mention specifically uh, media excitement over Bloomberg in 08 and a lot of media excitement over Huntsman early on in 12. It had also mentioned that uh, Obama thought the media was destined to pick Romney as the winner of the first debate just to keep the race interesting. Um, so where do you think the media fits in, in kind of shaping that dynamic? I'm, I'm laughing only because it's such an extraordinarily broad uh, question. Um, what is the role of the media in modern presidential elections? Go. Um, I think, that, uh, I, look, I mean, it, one of the things that is, that, that is uh, th there's nothing in, in presidential politics, I mean literally almost nothing that I can think of where the media, writ large or small, whether you know, from in, in all of its incarnations, um, increasingly you know, uh, influential individuals with Twitter feeds that matter, all the way up to the biggest, most esteemed establishment editorial institutions in the country, there's nothing in the campaign that, that, the, that, the, that the media doesn't affect, nothing, because it's how most voters learn about presidential politics. And, and so much of what presidential candidates do, and this again affects everything they do, whether it's you know, persuasion or mobilization or uh, at every facet of the campaign of fundraising, is about how things will be perceived by what you know, we shorthand as the filter. Because that's what the media is, is the filter for, you know, it shapes the narrative and the storyline and it is, whether it's local news, which actually has much more effect on how voters see the race, it turns out, than the national media, although the local news is affected by the national news. But it's an incredibly complex ecosystem, and the management of, of how things play and how things are perceived and reported 
is to some extent the, the paramount, and if not paramount, it's certainly the, it's both paramount and pervasive. It undergirds everything the campaigns do. So they think about that, you know, there's no single decision they make that they don't think about it through that prism. Um, we could talk about this from a lot of different possible angles, but that, that, that's the broadest and most comprehensive answer I can give you on, about, about it. It's, it is, you know, it is almost everything in campaigns is, is, is the media and, and how it filters um, what happens. I'll make one, one caveat there, which is in a presidential campaign, um, people are really, really interested and they will watch things like debates. And they make, to my mind, they make their decisions on the basis of what they see on the stage and who they want to have. The presidency is the most intimate office um, of any political office because the president lives in your, in your kitchen, lives in your living room, tells you the bad news. And I think that people make a gut level decision when they watch these debates in particular um, about who they want to have telling them the bad news and maybe even the good news over the next four years. Uh, of course, all of what they say has been framed and filtered by us <laughs> to begin with, but there is that personal quality to a presidential campaign that you don't see in many other campaigns. Hi, my name is David Scharfenberg. Um, uh, talk about the technological gap between the Obama and Romney campaigns. Uh, George W. Bush was thought to have sort of the uh, get out the vote edge uh, prior to that. I, is it just a matter of time before Republicans catch up or is there some cultural gap here where uh, the Democrats can draw on all those uh, uh, blue Google employees and it will hit the Republicans won't be able to in the next four or eight years? I think it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you know, I think they've sort of, uh, two assumptions that are made that I think are wrong about the next campaign. One is that everyone's gonna be able to raise a billion dollars and that everybody's gonna use social media. I think one of the big advantages the president has, and President Bush had this too, although it was in a different age, so it wasn't fully tested, is he's a great social media brand. Uh, appeals to young people, understands the technology more than most politicians, and I think, I think the Republicans will be behind until they have a general election candidate who gets all of that, and a number of people who are talked about as presidential candidates um, have a much greater, not just their own relationship to social media, but again, their brands are just more um, uh, likely to be saleable that way. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, there's efforts underway now to try to catch up. I think you need the brand to kind of supercharge that. But in terms of attracting talent, trying to envision what will be state of the art by 2015, um, and raising enough money to build that, Republicans are, they're probably further along in that, if you made a list of all the things where they, they were really far behind in the Obama era, they're further along there than in almost any other way. Further along there than appealing to Hispanics, further along there than, um, than figuring out the Electoral College and had a breakthrough, almost every area, but they're still pretty far behind. The, you know, the, the president's team has done some things that suggest they're gonna help the next Democratic nominee, whoever it is, uh, with all that stuff. And I think it's amongst the most important uh, developments for Hillary Clinton if she runs is some of the president's tech people have suggested they would be for her. That's a huge, a huge advantage because she was badly outgunned in that area last time. So I think Republicans have a chance, but they, like with a lot of other things on the presidential level, they start from a pretty, a pretty big deficit. John Thompson, I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School. Why was Ron Paul unable to get mainstream media exposure in 2012, and why do you dismiss Rand Paul in 2016 as a primary contender? Well, I don't think either of us dismissed him. Oh, I, he was listing the, the top tier candidates. I don't was, think he's in the top tier, but I don't dismiss him, and it's possible that no one in the top tier will run, so. I, go ahead. Well, I think the, um, I think the reason that Ron Paul uh, did not get more, I mean, it's, it's not that he got no mainstream media attention, but he got, well, he a limit, I'll agree, I agree with that. I think much of, and I'm, I'm gonna offer these judgments not, uh, not as an endorsement of the views, because I know people feel strongly about Ron Paul, but um, th this is just a, a, an objective assessment of what the media collectively thinks, which is that he's a fringe candidate whose views are, put him in a position where it was impossible for him to gain the Republican nomination and therefore impossible to gain the presidency. 
So candidates who are deemed by the media collectively to have no chance in the race um, tend to not get as much attention as those who are deemed to have some chance. Um, I think Rand Paul, broadly speaking, gets a lot more positive coverage than his father, um, and, and I think is someone who, to the extent that Mark and I, I, I agree, I think, that he's not in the top tier of candidates, is that um, if you look at the last 50 years post-Goldwater of, Rep of the Republican Party, the candidate who gets the nomination has never been the candidate, has, I don't think has ever been a candidate from the United States Senate, number one, on the Republican side, and has never been a candidate who represented the far right of his party. Um, they've always been candidates that have been closer to the mainstream. Ronald Reagan was not the most conservative candidate who ran in, in 1980. Um, Gerald Ford, not the most conservative who ran in 1976. Richard Nixon, J John McCain, just you can name them all the way through. Some candidate who is closer to what is perceived as mainstream conservatism, someone who's acceptable to the far right, acceptable to the base, but who also is a, a more of an establishment candidate, is the candidate that tends to win the nomination. And the combination of, of, of Senator Paul's place in the Senate and, and his place on the ideological spectrum, I think, makes him an interesting candidate who isn't a top tier candidate. But again, as Mark said, you know, the dynamics in 2016 could be really, could be really quite wild. And the Republican Party is in a state of something close to the Civil War right now. So um, how exactly it could be the year in which, uh, the first year since 1964, that the party deviates and you know, a party that's much more of a grassroots candidate um, ends up prevailing. Um, and John, as, as, I, Joe said, as Joe said, we're horrible at predicting, so. Um, I, am I wrong, or was there a moment in Iowa when Paul seemed to be breaking through? I remember writing columns about this, I'm and he did Iowa get too. a lot of, what? I'm from Iowa, too. Yeah. Where? Jefferson, west of Des Moines. Ah, okay, I'm sure we've all yeah. been there. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think I've spent more time in Iowa than I've spent with my wife, um, but <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. Um, uh, but I certainly think that he got more favorable and yeah. greater coverage in 2012 than he did it in 2008. There's a, there's a bad bias, as John said, against candidates who don't seem like they can win. And that's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think one of the biggest flaws in our system now in terms of ex exposing people to ideas is uh, there's a bias towards the two-party system. We have two relatively centrist parties. Uh, so a lot of Dr. Paul's ideas and Senator Paul's ideas uh, are different than the two main parties. It is the case in this era that a lot of young people know more about Dr. Paul's positions than most people who favor other candidates do. So I don't think, I, don't, I think there's plenty of information out there available. There should be more in the so-called mainstream media, and there should be examination of his ideas, both the ones that maybe aren't that popular, but also ones like opposition to certain wars that I think would have more of a following. I think it's incumbent upon the Pauls, and the son has done a better job of this than the father, to package them in a way that suggests popularity, maybe electoral viability, but also explain them in a way that, that even if they don't win, their ideas maybe are taken up by other candidates in the race. I don't think Dr. Paul did a very good job of that on most issues, but again, uh, uh, the press should do a better job of taking any candidate who has distinctive ideas that have some following, even if it's not a majority, and giving them greater play than we do. Uh, doesn't seem as if there are any more. Let me ask, let me ask one last question. Um, and once again, I'm gonna ask you to do what we do poorly, which is to make a prediction. But it's a weird kind of prediction. Um, and I don't know the answer to this. Um, we've all spent the last six or seven years covering Barack Obama. Uh, what kind of a, what do you think is next for him? What kind of a former president is he going to be? Is he going to be in our face all the time like Bill Clinton? Or is he going to be more reticent like George W. Bush? Or is he going to be something else entirely? Well, I, 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 it's a rare, rare question where I don't really know what Mark will say. So I'll, I'll speak, rather than speak for both of us, I'll speak for myself. I think that, that he will, I mean, we've just heard some discussion about the possibility he may stay in Washington, D.C. And he's mm -hmm. raised that possibility. So the question of location is a little bit up for grabs. I know, you know there's a lot of competition going on right now in Chicago over um, where his presidential library and foundation might right. be. Um, I think the draw for him to go back to the south side of Chicago, both for not only for reasons that his, so much of his, 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 of his history is there, but because of what the economic development impact on that part of the city would be if the foundation and library got put there, 
will be very, very powerful for him. Um, I, I, I cannot, given the way that he currently looks, I mean, he's never been someone who has cared really about the Democratic Party in any meaningful mm -hmm. way. He, he cares about ideas and policies and, and, and progressive, pragmatic progressive goals, but party building has not been anything that's mattered to him, either before he became president or as president. I can't imagine he's gonna, he's gonna be the kind of, he's gonna be interested in being a major party figure after he finishes. And I think at heart, what we, what we know about him is he's a, he's a writer. And I think unlike most presidents who have sat down to write memoirs, some of whom have, been, have done decent jobs, some of whom have done terrible jobs, some of whom have managed to you know, spend, like Bill Clinton, spend you know, a couple years not doing anything and then written a thousand page book in about two months, uh, and it shows. I think he will be a, he will take a long time. That was a diary dump, that wasn't a book. That's what I mean. I think he will take a long time and I think he will write, again, whatever you think of his policies and his mm -hmm. politics, I think he'll probably write one of the most kind of awesome presidential memoirs that anybody's ever written because he has the authorial gifts and the detachment to be able to look back uh, and write about himself in a way that few other presidents have been able to do. He has it within himself to do that, so I wouldn't be surprised if he actually right. does it. I think he'll paint less than George Bush, but otherwise be mm -hmm. pretty similar. Um, he won't be out campaigning the way Bill Clinton does. I don't think he'll seek a big role, um, uh, except perhaps at the convention every four years, different than President Bush. And I think he will um, maybe be a little bit more high profile in the causes he believes in than President Bush has been, although President Bush does that on occasion. But I think in terms of sort of the balance between uh, doing good works and uh, paid speeches mm -hmm. and high profile versus low profile will be a lot closer to Bush 43 than uh, to Bill Clinton. Well, I've, I've set out a personal challenge to him. Um, he's always been very interested in my fiction writing. And I said, you probably tried it, didn't you? And you, I said, and you chickened out. You have it in your desk drawer somewhere, some part of a novel. I said, if you have any guts, you're gonna try fiction. Because as John said, this guy is fundamentally a writer. He has a writer's personality uh, in addition to everything else. But anyway, you've been wonderful as always. And you guys have been wonderful. And uh, I'll see you in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.